acknowledge my existence. All right, I should be live, maybe. Oh, this isn't gonna work. There we go. There's Dean, all right. Uh, that appears to have fixed it, Dean. Why did it fix it? I don't know, we're live by the way. So just, you know, just in case. Oh, I can't hear you, you're muted. The mute button is down in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Still muted. I could see the mute button there. It's down in the bottom left-hand corner. It's got a little line through it. And if that doesn't work, you might have to get yeah, troubleshooting. Um, and then you might need to choose a different device in the bottom left. So it'll drop down. And then you can pick. So you're unmuted now. You just need to pick whichever device is the microphone you think you're using. Or let your internet crash. Hey, everybody. Uh, well, Dean continues to troubleshoot his uh, technical setup. I just thought I would, uh, well, let's get, uh, we'll get into this. A little larger, let me see. All right. Move that around a bit. Usually I have this more prepared in advance. No, nope, this is the size it's gonna be. Oh, great. And now the uh, fire alarm's gone off. I'm going to mute my, uh, is this, is this going to happen again? My wife is making some kind of roasted cauliflower and, uh, apparently it, uh, set off the, <laughs> the fire alarm. So can't be certain that it isn't going to happen again if in a few minutes it's going to uh all right uh so anyway uh if you're wondering what it is that you're experiencing so far this is of course what happens when we do things live as opposed to when we take all this time and we prepare in advance and we edit things after the fact so uh <sighs> well that can works that? i can hear that now all right, finally. I love computers. <laughs> What's well, good? Your your arrival uh, perfectly uh, happened with uh, a fire alarm here in my house. So hey, I, perfect. All right, all right. Yeah. No fires, I hope. Everybody's okay. Oh yeah, no. I mean, if anything, we're all going to be able to enjoy roasted cauliflower in about twenty more minutes. It's, nice. Yeah. Nice. But you know, anytime you use your oven for anything, it sets off your fire alarms because technology. Right, right. Well, it's not your fault though, though right? It's uh, somebody else's. No, right? no, no. My, yeah, my wife is. My wife is currently uh, making some food. Who oh, are okay. you? What's going on? Who is this person who's joining me here this week? Hi, I am uh, Dean Regis, astronomer from the Cincinnati Observatory and uh, co-host of PBS's Stargazers, and uh, glad to be here with you today. And thanks for bearing with all the technical difficulties. No fire alarms over here. Yeah, no problem. They, whatever was going on with your video card, rebooting your computer definitely fixed it. So Excellent. the reason he was here at the last minute was because there's some weird interference going on with his with the screen. So this is perfect. So uh, for people who don't know Dean, I think you've been on the Weekly Space Hangout once or twice, twice? Yes, I think twice yeah. before. Yeah. 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 And um we talk all things uh, astronomy specifically uh, especially visual astronomy and you know although there's going to be other things to talk about one thing that i've got here is i've got i've got two of your books handy 100 things to see in the night sky yep, yep. and 100 things to see in the southern night sky which has got to just be constantly blowing the minds of the people in the Southern Hemisphere that yeah. you took the time to write a book, which I'm going to say is the same size, maybe a little bigger, uh, but has the same level of love and energy put into the things that the folks in the Southern Hemisphere can see as opposed to the people in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, even, yeah. Uh, you know, we like you know, like all uh, astronomy writers gave the Southern Hemisphere short shrift. We gave them 
you know, five pages. You in our, five. That's pretty good. Yeah. Five events. That's, that's not bad. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> our big book on uh, astronomy. So that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm an uh, observational astronomer. So I, I uh, look at the, the night sky with the naked eye and minimal equipment. And uh, so I wrote these books as ideas for, for folks that just want to get outside with their backyard and look up there. Uh, so the first book, 100 Things to See in the Night Sky, this covers about, well, I'd say about 95 of them can be seen with the naked eye. There are a couple of them that are a little bit tougher. You need to be in a dark sky. You need to have some binoculars, something like that. But it's a good way to get started and has some star charts in there. And one of the parts that I added was a uh, difficulty level. There's easy objects, there's moderate objects, and there's difficult objects. And maybe I snuck in one that's like impossible, but you know, I threw it in there anyway. Like some kind uh, of quasar or something. Uh, I think I put, uh, I think I put the Hercules cluster in there, which is, you know, technically visible to the naked eye, right. but uh, you need to have like that 2010 vision or something. But the, uh, so then uh, the, uh, the publisher said, well, you know, uh, we heard Dean that uh, the Southern hemisphere sees different stars. And I was like, Yes, that is correct. They do see different stars. And they said, well, can you write a whole different book on the Southern Hemisphere? Yeah. And I said, uh, well, I've been to the Southern Hemisphere one time in my life, and that was to Peru. Uh, so that definitely does not make me an expert on the Southern Hemisphere. But uh, I, uh, I did my best. I uh, had this great simulation software here that I can I immersed myself in the Southern Hemisphere. I pretended that I was in uh, Sydney, Australia, and that's where I kind of wrote the book in my mind from yeah uh and uh so it was uh there's there's some stuff from the northern hemisphere uh, book and then a whole lot of new stuff for the southern hemisphere so it was it, 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 i really immersed myself in it so it took me uh, maybe a three or four weeks to get out of it so like i was looking outside the sky and i was like where's the southern cross <laughs> yeah it's not here oh right you're in cincinnati I feel, so right, like, right. it really yeah. was there for a while <laughs> yeah i've seen it only once as well so back in july i was in australia mm -hmm. in um sort of on the east coast and my wife and i took a uh we rented an rv and then went north from there and so we went into fairly dark skies it was dark to begin with where we started in byron bay and then went mm -hmm. north from there just got darker and darker and it was like no question the the southern skies are better than the northern skies for just sheer impressive like we stand out and you look up and you see the milky way and the core of the milky way is going straight overhead as you're closer to the equator the you know the the planets were all passing again directly overhead from my perspective you can oh, yeah. see the large and small magellanic clouds you get to see the milky way and then you get to see two more of them which are more impressive than andromeda and then you see uh you can see the omega uh cluster again with your own yep. eyes in nice dark skies so it was a it was an absolute treat and there's something really great because all of my astronomy is to see you know, when I see the core of the Milky Way, I'm even maybe a little more north than you. I'm at around the 50th mm -hmm. parallel. Right. And so it is Sagittarius is just down on the horizon. You have to peer through the murk and you can just see just the faintest, you know, version of these of these objects. It's not great. But there again, yeah, look right up with your own eyes. You can see the Lagoon Nebula and the Eagle Nebula and the and the, the Swan and all of these just right overhead. So um i i highly yeah. recommend it but the one thing that we've got that they don't have is galaxies so i like to taunt my southern hemisphere friends <laughs> as i you know they, they don't have very good galaxies that's right that's right oh that's and you've been doing a lot of traveling lately too i mean this is something that uh that uh, you know i really like to encourage is to people to do trips and and take uh have astronomy be part of their vacations to go around to see observatories or go to places where there's dark skies where you can really see the Milky Way really well. And uh, Southern Hemisphere is a great way to, to see some new stars. Yeah, yeah. So just to, I mean, to say, I know people, a lot of people there are asking a lot of questions, uh, stuff that's maybe outside of your specific wheelhouse. And so I wanted to use this as an opportunity for us to just absolutely nerd out about observational astronomy, amateur astronomy, telescopes to buy, things to see, 
and experiences that you can get with with the night sky. So yeah, um, let's let's just start with like literally the question you're going to get the most, which is which telescope do you recommend that people start with? I I love to yeah. hear everyone's response to this one. Yeah, because everybody has their own take. They have different things they like more than others. Uh, I'm I'm a guy I like simplicity and I like big size uh, for a cheap amount of money. Uh, so the, the one that I found that's the sweet spot for me is uh, I like Dobsonian. So there's the ones that are mounted like Lazy Susan. So they move left, right, up and down. And you can get really big ones for a pretty good good price. Uh, so I, you know, I, have to, I have to go with, with uh, the one that I like the best. My favorite scope of all time is the Orion X-T8. Mm -hmm. It's a eight inch diameter reflector telescope. And it's just, it's like the right size. I can carry it. I can fit it in my car and, uh, and it's pretty reasonably priced too. Uh, so that's the one I start with. I'm not big on the ones with, uh, you know, giant, uh, mounts and the Schmidt cast grains. I, I know I'm seeing that one. In the back. <laughs> that's, you know, yeah. But yeah, you want to see was, the dust? You want to see the dust that's yeah, on it? We'll, yeah. We'll see. That's the thing is you have to get one that's the right portability too. So, yeah. so I had this Orion XT8, loved it, took it out all over the place. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to upgrade. I got to get a bigger, bigger one. So I got a 12 with some computerized stuff on it. And I went from a 36 pound telescope that can fit in my car to a 86 pound telescope that I can barely fit in my car, but I can't have any passengers. Right. And it's like, and so it's, uh, well, if I turn my camera around, it's right over there and it's gathering as yeah. much dust as yours. And, and so it's the, the thing about portability is really important, but well, that's a pretty sweet setup you got back there though. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a <laughs> 70 millimeter refractor on a, yeah. on a pretty beefy mount. And you know, it's, a, it's an, an, it's an astrophotography device, but I think, yeah. you know, my experience, I agree 100% on the eight inch Dobsonian. And I absolutely agree. Don't go bigger because, right. because the magic of a Dobsonian, especially an eight-inch Dobsonian, is that you're going to grab you grab the thing by the front of the, you know, of the uh, aperture. You just gr you know drag it around, point it at different objects, and very quickly see the thing that you want to see. Be it Jupiter, be it the Moon, be it Saturn, whatever. But for the sort of some of the fainter objects. A 12-inch Dobsonian actually isn't going to give you a much better view of, say, Jupiter or Saturn or the Orion Nebula or any of those things. Maybe some fainter objects can go, yeah, I definitely saw a fuzzy bit where on the 8-inch I couldn't see a fuzzy bit. But, but the magic of the more powerful telescopes really starts to come in when you go into astrophotography. Yeah, and, exactly. And so all of that bigger, better – all of that stuff is, is totally unnecessary if all you want to do is visual observations. Yeah, and so that's so for me, I, I'm terrible with a camera. I can't take a picture. Of, I can barely take a picture of lunar eclipse this last uh, couple weeks. Um, so for me, taking pictures is an important, but if you really want to do that and you're skilled at that, then you have to get a different type of style. So the Dobsonian is probably not the right one for you. You need kind of a, a refractors are great, like the one you have behind you. Uh, you get these big five inch refractors. And, uh, um, I think those work really well. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's one of those things. So then as you go for accessories, you can get, you know, accessorize this thing as much as you want, but you can get $500 eyepieces, $600 eyepieces. And I've looked through all these different things and, uh, a $500 eyepiece is better than a $50 eyepiece, but is it that much better? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a tough one. So my philosophy is, um, so I, I'm, I'm you know, a member of the Cincinnati Observatory and we have a amateur astronomy club that goes with us, is that if, if you're really looking, uh, join an astronomy club, an astro amateur astronomy club and see what other equipment people have. You can try out some different ones. And I will be honest, what I do is, uh, well, the, some guys have much bigger telescopes. They have these, uh, have you seen the Obsession telescopes? They're 25 inch diameter mirrors. Right. You have to drag it out on a flatbed truck and stuff like that. Yeah. And so we have these guys that have 20 and 25 inch diameter obsessions. And I'm like, Hey, uh, can I use your telescope? And you know, you just use their telescopes. Yeah. They paid the money. Yeah. Uh, and they uh, brought it, they set it up. They, 
they yeah, use put their it in their obsession, car. You know? Yeah. So, uh, and then you can decide if you really want to spend that money. But uh, yeah, I'd say start small first and see if you really have an interest in it first. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, you, you never want to get it too big too fast. And uh, there's always there's always time to get more. Well, and and I really find like with the observational stuff, there really maybe are about, I'm gonna say maybe twenty objects that are wonderful to look at in a telescope with your own eyeballs. Right. 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 The various planets, um, th some of the you know globular clusters, some of the open clusters, some of the brighter nebulae, but even those, and like maybe a couple of galaxies, and and beyond that the smallest telescope with a camera is going to give you a much better view than what you're going to be able to see with your with your own eyeballs and so people just yeah they, exactly they go down the and wrong now, rabbit so, hole and part of me does consider photography cheating I, there's just a little bit of it me thinks all right come on use your eyes but uh you know like uh yeah sure you can process it and photoshop and all that but no, I, I, that stuff is some sweet pictures that people can get. And we have some members, I mean, they've taken these pictures that are like Hubble quality pictures with their own backyard telescopes. And maybe it's just, I'm just jealous. That's what it is. I'm like, I, I want to see it with my eyes, but yeah. man, that's a pretty good picture. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, it, and it's just like, it, it, it's just another level. I mean, it's just another obsession to go into. And, but once you start going down the photography route, then you've got hundreds thousands yeah. of objects yeah. over the course of the year that you can try to capture and each one is its own separate obsession so if you want to throw a hundred hours into taking one picture of the heart nebula you can right an object oh, you yeah. can't even see with a with a with a regular telescope this is an object that you can and all, all the stuff that you see on astronomy picture of the day and stuff those are all people's obsessions right so. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing what amateur astronomers can do. And and there's this, you know, my philosophy is there's a very, very blurry line between amateur and professional astronomer. I mean, there the amateur astronomers know all, so much about what's up in the sky, and uh, we're seeing all these things like uh, when the uh, the meteor hit the moon during the lunar eclipse. It was amateur astronomers that, that captured that, yeah. and uh, fellows that saw you know meteors hitting Jupiter and. Uh, and comets discovery. I mean, it's just amazing the stuff that that people can do with their own equipment. I had a live stream of the of the eclipse going uh, on that Sunday, and in theory, I captured it, but yeah, yeah. but I haven't gone back <laughs> through quite. the four hours of footage to see if I did get it. And I and it's I just know a some fraction of a second. Uh, I, know, I, I know. I heard it was right at eleven forty one, you know, Eastern time at least. So like right when totality started, something hit it. Now, and I was looking through my telescope at the moon at that second, and I didn't see it. But that's that's what cameras are for, yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, then and we've also one time we discovered a supernova in a in a picture. Oh yeah, incident. yeah, oh, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it was a, and then the next day it was during one of our star parties, and we were looking at the galaxy, and someone noted, "Oh yeah, this is a galaxy that often has supernova, but there isn't one there right now, but there was one there right." And you're now. like, "Hey, there's my picture." Yeah, there yeah, it is. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we looked back the next day, and yep, there it was. There was the supernova, and someone else oh, did the actual so cool. announcement. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and since to this day now, Dave Dickinson, whenever he looks at pictures of space is like is there a supernova in there just to be sure yeah he's lit out yeah yeah i met this one uh astronomer that you know he used to go to classes around in cincinnati and he discovered a planet an exoplanet yeah and i said uh well so like how many uh how many stars have you been looking at you know you, know, you think you gotta look at thousands and thousands of stars before you see a planet and he's like oh yeah it was like my 10th one i was like you saw it on your 10th star you found a planet he's like yeah, is that good? I was like, yeah, that's really rare. Like people look at for thousands of you know, thousands of stars for ten dozens of years, they don't find a planet. You found it on your tenth one. He's like, yeah, yep. I guess I'm pretty like <laughs> that's just the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, you know, folks there who have astronomy questions, especially gear questions, things to look at questions. I would love to run some of these past past Dean. We've got some yeah, got yeah. some other got some other questions 
Um, but again, like I said, they might be. Uh, they I can be... I can take any question there is. I can always say I don't know, or yeah, I can yeah, also yeah. say the government won't let me, or uh, aliens. That does. So those are my three <laughs> possible answers. It's all. It's all. It's all I'd be aliens. happy to answer one of the uh, one of those three questions. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, go ahead and hit us with any questions that you uh, that people have. And while I'm waiting, I'll look for some questions as well. Uh, yeah. Right now, here we are. Um, it's January, February now. February. Uh, yeah. What uh, What would you recommend people go out and take a look at? What's well, up, what's so, up right uh, now? Right now, the big thing's Orion. Orion is the main main guy up there in the the southeastern sky. You can see the three stars in a row for the belt. Really easy to identify. And uh, so what I like to do at this time of year is look at the stars of Orion. You can really tell the different brightnesses, of course, but you can also see some color differentiation. So if you look at them really carefully, you can see one of the, the belt stars are all blue. Uh, the, I have to remember which side. Okay, this side, yeah, no, the other side. Wait. Depends which hemisphere you're at. Yeah, yeah, the other side, there's a one, one shoulder star is blue and the other shoulder star is orange. And you can really see these different colors, and then you can kind of delve into uh, you know the names. We've got Beetlejuice, we got Bellatrix, we've got uh, uh, Rigel, and then we've got then you can aim your telescope and binoculars at the Orion Nebula, uh, which is you know the best uh, best deep space object that you can see at this time of year. And uh, so that's you know Orion's a great place to get started. And uh, we just had uh, you know the Super Bowl yesterday, and so. There's a formation up in the sky that I call the winter football. Now, most people call it the winter circle or the winter hexagon, but you know, uh, in America, we have to call it uh, the football because that's what it looks like for us. Uh, so you can check out this is huge feature that goes from one side of the sky to the other, and it's this big ring of eight of the 20 top 20 bright stars are right there. So that's uh, that's the big feature right now. Uh, and I don't know if you saw uh, fairly recent news that the Orion Nebula, the stars in the Orion Nebula, the winds blowing out of those those young stars are so strong that they are killing off any new stars from forming. They've sort of shut down really? the, uh, oh, the rest of the star formation in the in the Orion Nebula. All right, now I've got a couple of questions here. Great. All right, so unregistered Great. user is asking, what's an affordable telephoto lens or telescope with an 800 millimeter focal length? Wow, that's a very specific question. Yeah. Uh, aliens. No, wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> Someone noted uh, that you have to have your hair a little more sticking up if you're going to That's right. You need to pile yeah. it up here a little yeah. bit higher. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, with 800 millimeter focal length. So, we, uh, you know, there's ones that, the, that we use at the observatory are celestron refractors. And we've got these two refractors that we've had for a long time. So you can, you know, you can even look on the used market for refractors because they are pretty solid things that don't get messed up too easily. Uh, and we've got these two, they're, uh, they're 80 millimeter, about 800, uh, 80 millimeter diameter, 800 millimeter length. And uh, I've taken those, uh, taken one of those to a solar eclipse, lunar eclipses, both transits of Venus. And I had this camera that attaches to an eyepiece. You screw the eyepiece into the camera and then put it in there. But uh, that's, I'd go with a, yeah, a Celestron refractor is a really good way to go. Or there's these Mead refractors that are a little bit larger in size that I've had some good luck with too. Um, but then the, the camera, man, that's, there's so many different types of cameras you can go with. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the big thing is the mount how you can attach it to the scope itself. And each one has its own kind of little, little nuances. So um, I'd recommend scope first, camera second, yep. and see which camera matches up, unless you already have the camera. Then, well, that's the yeah, possibility, yeah. right? That a lot of people have is they already have a, a DSLR camera that they have, right. like they have a, a Canon or a Nikon or a Sony or something like that. And if you do, then you can buy an adapter called a T adapter that will let you connect your camera without a lens right to the telescope. And now the telescope becomes the lens for your camera. And yeah, it's exactly. A great that's way to get great into way it. To get. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and you can and actually yeah, buy that's... those cameras relatively inexpensively. They're only if you buy like a used one, a few hundred dollars for even a full frame sensor now is is not that bad. Yeah, so it's called a T mount. And then the other one, I don't know if you have one of these, you can get a clip that'll let you use your phone as a camera. Yeah, exactly. There's these adapters. Yeah, you slide your phone into it. You put the phone up to the eyepiece, and you can 
screw it on there. It's like kind of attaches to it. And uh, yeah, I, I tried my hand at that with the lunar clips and eh, not too good. But again, I'm one of the worst astrophotographers out there. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, if I had my way, I would just like hand draw everything that I see. That's what I'd probably that's, do. That, that's a legit, <laughs> absolutely way of appreciating the night sky is, is, is astro sketchography. That's right. So we have a, the Cincinnati has a, has a history with this. Our observatory a hundred years ago, uh, we had a, uh, an argument between the new young astronomer that came on staff that wanted to take pictures and the old fashioned astronomer who wanted to keep drawing. And in the end, the drawing won and the uh, photographer left the observatory. He was so mad. He formed his rival observatory on the other side of town. And, uh, of course, he was right, and we were wrong. <laughs> I hate being on the wrong side of that, that the photographers were right. But we were like, you pesky photographers with all your chemicals, and I can just draw it in two seconds. And there, look, there it is. I yeah. did it. But, yeah, yeah, we were on the wrong side of that one. <laughs> um, Eric2000 is asking, um, what's it like going to Iceland? Uh, have you been to Iceland? I have been to Iceland. Yeah, I just recently was there uh, just last September, and it's a pretty amazing place. Uh, it's it's really pretty easy to get to. It's not very far, at least from the eastern uh, U.S. And, and Canada and Midwest. Uh, and it was just so easy to get around. Uh, the skies were, you know, gorgeous when it was clear. That's the tricky yeah. part is it's cloudy there so often. So I unfortunately did not see the northern lights. Uh, but, uh, when it did get clear, yeah, I got to see some amazing stars. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the best uh, time I would seen the Northern lights was in, uh, 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 Newfoundland and Alberta. Those are the only times I've seen it. And boy, that's amazing. Yeah. So I would love to go back to Iceland again, if nothing else, just to, uh, uh, to see so many, uh, waterfalls. Oh yeah. man, it was just like, everywhere you go is just gorgeous. So uh, I was yeah, there was awesome. about a year ago. Uh, with Paul Sutter, and we had just a horrible storms. Like, was that the one you got snowed in? I heard about mm -hmm. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was brutal, brutal storms, which was pretty hilarious. So we yeah. were spending a, uh, we were spending some time sort of socked in. But we did get. I mean, the great thing about Iceland is you can, if if the skies are clear, you can see auroras, like like almost any time with a camera for sure. Uh, yep, yep. And then, and if you're lucky, things will really build up, and you can see the just the really stunning ones. I didn't see them, but um, but we have, uh, but I have seen them well here, and I saw them really well on an airplane one time when I was flying out of Alberta, and you could see just oh, these, cool. yeah, but the, like the ribbons that were just off on the horizon, it was just amazing. Yeah, I highly, oh, man, I highly that's recommend cool. it. The, well, we'll have to go back to Iceland, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm I'm probably going to be there uh, next a year from now. Oh, so, good. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'll probably be going be going back and probably try to get back at least once a year. Like like with a lot of this stuff, you have to be in it. You have to you have to put yourself in a place where you can see it. I've got an app on my phone that will tell me when the auroral activity is pretty high in my location. And that I should be able to see some activity over on the, you know, to the north. And then we have a beach that we go to that's nearby that I go out to. And we set up our cameras and then we just wait. And if we're lucky, we will see the, you know, we will see the auroras. And sometimes we don't. But it's like. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is the, that is my number two most awesome thing to see in the nighttime sky. I mean, that, there's only one thing that can compare to that. And that is something that's on a whole another level so i would imagine you know what i'm talking about yeah. uh, it's a total solar eclipse I yes mean, uh, auroras are the only thing that can come close to the the magic of a, of a, of a total solar eclipse so yeah if you haven't seen auroras you got to yeah. like, make a trip up there hopefully we have a little more solar activity coming up because it's been real quiet lately but uh well that you know farther north you go the more chances you get well, there's a coronal hole right now, actually, that's pointing towards the Earth. There's been a bunch of them in the last couple of days, and there's, they've oh, been sending cool. increased solar activity. Uh, there was a pretty big, or some aurora activity over top of Iceland um, and northern of Canada. Course. Yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, my recommendation is always um, get like get an app on your phone that'll tell you when the auroras are going to happen. Dial it in so that it knows where you live and knows what level of activity you would need. And then when the, 
uh, Aurora goes off and then go out and see if you can see it. And where, like where you are, you should be able to see them from time to time, although I'm sure your light pollution yeah. is pretty miserable. Yeah, yeah, we're pretty far south, actually. We're the uh, we're about 39 degrees latitude, so we're pretty far down there. Uh, I've only seen them in Cincinnati one time. That was in 2001 with a big solar storm. Uh, and that, so about every 10 years we see them here, so very rare. But uh, yeah, the place I go to is uh, spaceweather.com. That's yeah. a good place to, to get a lot of that stuff. But you're right, there's apps for that. There's uh, probably... I, no, no, space weather. They used to like call you. I think they just text you now or something like that when it's in your area, which I, I always, uh, everybody at the observatory knows if there's Northern Lights, they have my home phone number. They can wake me up at any time. If there's Northern Lights outside, I will not be mad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll do that. We should set up, I'll set up some kind of phone alert system. And then That's right. Red, just... the red phone hotline yeah. will ring right there to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll just call people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Dean, it's the auroras are happening. All right. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll, I'll fly right over there in my private jet, no yeah. problem. <laughs> like, again, well, how far do you have to go to get to see like a really nice Milky Way from where you live? Yeah, so that's that is a tricky part because uh, yeah, we're we're in a middle mid mid sized city, so we can see maybe down to magnitude three or four. Four is a good day if we can see magnitude four stars. Uh, but uh, to get out of the city, our, our members go out to this park. It's called Stone Lake State Park. It's about the four, a 45 minute drive east of us. And you can see the Milky Way there, you know, fairly well. Uh, it's pretty dark sky and that's where people set up the big telescopes uh, to view. But then if you really want to get out, yeah, the best idea is to look at those like maps of the dark the sky finder at night. Oh yeah, yeah. you can see which places you look at the maps from like taken from the space shuttle and space station you can see where the dark areas are go to those uh so closest to us is uh upper peninsula michigan which is unfortunately eight hours drive from us so it is there's not a lot that we can go to see i mean maybe there's the great the smoky mountains down south in tennessee but it's the, the whole Midwest. It's getting tougher and tougher every every year. Uh, so that's that's why for me it's part of my vacation plans. When I go places, I want to seek out dark skies. So I go to um, Grand Canyon almost every year because they're making a dark sky park out of it. Yeah. And then there's a Crater Lake in Oregon, which is a great place to go to get away from things a little bit. Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, and. Uh, uh, the, yeah, there's just look on the maps to see where there's not lights. That's the place to go. Uh, so question from, oh, where was it here? Hold on, hold on. Okay. Sean Marson asks, Hey guys, thanks for the show tonight. I got a Celestron 127 SLT for Christmas. Any tips for a newbie on getting the most out of a Mac cast type scope? Oh man, Max Casas. Uh, yeah, those are not my favorites. I'll be honest with yep. you. But uh, if you can get them going, like a uh, Max, better than just a cast. But um, it, uh, that one, the Max one Sukov, makes, Cassegrain? yeah, Max Toff Casagrain. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what that one looks like off the top of my head. Well, they look like uh, a they look like a tiny little Newtonian telescope with a okay right with a. I'm a, so it's I'm, probably a short, short tube uh, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and I'm assuming it's got a manual, but but it probably has. A, you'll have to give us a few more details, but I'm assuming it's got a. It's going to have a equatorial mount on it, but I think those ones usually have like a little dial so that you can, you know, you can track the sky with them. Yeah, those those style are like a. Uh, they're like a. I wouldn't say fine wine. What was I going to say? It's, just, it's an acquired taste. That's what those the Max are. And there's people that swear by them and like, this is the best view you'll ever see in your entire life. And I've looked through some and I'm like, yeah, this is a pretty good view. Yeah. Uh, but then I've also tried it myself and I'm just like, it's like I'm all thumbs with this thing. Like I can't focus it very well. The, the focuser is so touchy on most of those, but they're pretty good for photography too, if you can get them going. Yeah, but a, a lot of the, um, the, Astrophotographers that go after planets will use those big Newtonians mm -hmm. because it'll it's they give you like a just a really um you know like a they'll give you like a two thousand millimeter uh, focal length right and so yeah, you can yeah. see really tiny objects with them and so 
you know if but the trick is that it can be all very finicky to get to get to that point and so it's it's a it's a it's a tough thing and so you you can take good pictures with it but you do need to sort of keep everything in the in the field of view and you may just after a while want to throw the thing out the window and go get a dobsonian yeah but for a max with maybe a short focal length yeah you can get wider field of view so maybe you can look for you know open star clusters would be great objects to look at with that um, and then, yeah, I, I'd say some of those kind of things, something where you're looking for a wider, ang wider angle planets, probably not so much for that one, but, uh, yeah, I'd say start yeah. with like, uh, Hyades, Pleiades to that's those are the easy ones to get to. And then, uh, this time of year we're getting on the beehive cluster, which is up in cancer. That would be a pretty cool one to check out. Uh, maybe M 15 by, um, uh, Pegasus is a good one to try right now. And then in summertime, when M13 comes around, Hercules cluster, that should look real good in that scope. So it's, yeah, it's a matter of, exactly like you were saying, it's a matter of what objects are best for each scope. And so for that one, clusters uh, sticks out in my mind as that's what you want to go with. Yeah. Um, but like I said, some of my favorite planetary work is done with uh, Newtonian telescopes. So yeah, yeah. I, I highly recommend them. Um, so, so we're ha there's a bit of an argument going on in the chat. I just want to bring you in on this. Uh, sure. Cody's lab originally proposed his, his thought experiment, which was that if he fired off a, a projectile into space, uh, at around 1.3% the speed of light in a random direction, what are the odds of it ever actually hitting something? Whoa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. huh. Like a star, yeah, like or another a star, or... planet, anything in the in the universe, or you is it just throw space? that in a random direction? Yeah, what's the likelihood it'll hit anything? Uh, close to zero. Yeah, <laughs> that's I don't I can't give you the exact number, but it would be less than one tenth of a percent easily. I mean, the 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 idea that uh, you know all these spacecrafts that go out to places uh, like when we go out to Pluto. Uh, that was like, you know, hitting a, they said the equivalent of the, the New Horizons mission to Pluto is like hitting a golf ball from New York and getting a hole in one in LA. That's, that's the, the, the skill involved. Of course, on the way they can like, yeah, defer. tweak their, but anyway, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah. there go. So if you're, uh, and then the other one that always gets me is when we think of going through the asteroid belt, like yeah. when we're flying past Mars orbit into Jupiter's orbit, we have to watch out for all these asteroids like in Star Wars and they're like the Millennium Falcons going through all the asteroids. We we have to like actually purposefully aim at an asteroid and get anywhere close to it. Uh, so so there's, uh, if you randomly fire a rocket into space uh, and it would go, tw let's say you flew for a million years, you still probably wouldn't hit anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, and I mean, when you think about it, right, assuming that your spacecraft actually had escape velocity to get out of the Milky Way, so chances are you're going to move out of the Milky Way. And then you think, well, what if you had forever, right? It just went going and right. going and going. But the universe is expanding, dark energy is accelerating the expansion of the universe. And so you can imagine eventually everything is just accelerating away and your and your projectile is just carried off into the void and will never get close to anything ever well and it's hard for us to wrap our brains around the scale of things like we see maps of, of stars in our galaxy and they look like they're so jam-packed together but i mean our nearest star is 25 trillion miles away that, and, and it's you know it's a fairly big star but it's not anywhere like it's taking up that much of the sky and uh, so the, the other one that always got me is they said, you know, when galaxies are colliding. So we have the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way are colliding. They're going to run into each other in four to six billion years. And then the astronomers say, yeah, but when they collide, the stars won't even hit each other. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How can all these stars be passing by each other and nothing's hitting anything? It's like, well, because there's trillions of miles in between the stars. And uh, so if any two stars are going to hit each other in the Andromeda Milky Way merger, it's going to be a fluke. Um, but if you want to have a lot of mindless fun, I mean, if you want to waste a good 10 minutes every day, there's an app called Galaxy Collider, and you can run two, three, four, or five galaxies into each other. 
has no scientific merit whatsoever, but it's kind of cool <laughs> just to see all the front yeah. So Galaxy Collider, I highly recommend it for five or 10 minutes of fun. <laughs> Uh, Don Guru Debro is asking, uh, did you hear about this newly discovered galaxy in our neighborhood hiding behind the core of the Milky Way? Did you hear about this? No, I didn't hear about that. Um, and I haven't reported on it or, or studied it, but the, uh, the gist of it was there was a new dwarf galaxy that was found relatively in our cosmic neighborhood. Oh, really? Cool. And found behind the, the core of the Milky Way. And the thing with the Milky Way is for the longest time, right, there was this region that you just can't look through called the zone of avoidance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? that's right. <laughs> but but now uh, with radio telescopes and with infrared telescopes, they can see through all of the dust and gas that's in the, the disk of the Milky Way. So it's really not the zone of avoidance. It's more just like the zone of you have to be a much better astronomer and really ah, crunch your data. Yeah. And zone, zone of exclusion. Only, <laughs> yeah. only have a scope this big, then you can see it. Yeah, the that's zone of effort. Have. Yeah, as out of effort, there we go. yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the things is when we see the maps of the universe that they've made, that astronomers made, there's always this, like, this strip that you can't see through, this, like, kind of shape that's like that. And, uh, yeah, the fact that we're now able to look through that stuff, I mean, just the, the rest of the map is just going to fill in here very, very quickly. I mean, the last, in the next 10 years, we're going to be finding so many more galaxies out there that we never knew about. And so, uh, I don't know how many how many yeah satellite galaxies do we have and uh, the Milky Way. It's dozens it's, at this point. Uh, the one story that uh, that really attracted my attention was the study that found that the Large Magellanic Cloud was going to go by and then come back and crash into the Milky Way. And I don't know. I was read that and I was like, oh, this doesn't sound right. But because uh, we don't really know what's going on with the Large Magellanic Cloud, we don't know if it's just passing through we don't know if it's an orbit around us and so the latest is maybe it'll crash into us good news we got two billion years to find out so uh right. so stuff is slow moving out there and it'll be like a sneak preview and before it, we crash into andromeda yeah and um so this is a good one for the uh for the for people chatting is what uh merger name do they like better when andromeda and milky way come together do you like milk dromeda or androma way Hope now. I don't know. I'm yeah. I'm a, I'm Andromeda way myself. No. Oh I like, no. Like the milk Dromeda? I'm milk Dromeda. Yeah. Not only am I milk Dromeda, but I'm literally this is the hill that I will die on. So. <laughs> All uh, right. I don't really care that much. Yeah. So well, you see, see you I okay, really milk do, and <laughs> and am willing to fight uh, tooth and nail to convince anybody. Okay, I'm on your side. You right. convinced. Okay, me. perfect. That's great. That's we made that so easy. Well, I got another one then. So okay. you know the super moon. <laughs> Supermoon, yeah, 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 love Supermoon. Right, you know <laughs> the when you've got an apogee, perigee, no, yeah. you've got an apogee, uh, hold a syzygy. Apogee, syzygy, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So the, the forest moon, yeah, the opposite of the supermoon, yeah, where you've got the the moon is at the farthest point of its orbit away from the Earth. Uh, Dave Dickinson uh, came up with the term mini moon. Oh yeah, no, and, no, I've and, I've trademarked a new one. And but, we're, but, go ahead. We're trying to push this one. So mini moon. Okay, what's yours? It's mini moon. Mini moon? No, yeah. no, no, no. You, uh, no, because you got to go with the ooh sound. You know, the super moon. That's what you got. So puny moon oh. is the correct answer. Puny moon, trademarked right here. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. See, you mm. got to go with the ooh because it's All catchier. Right. Well, mini then moon, maybe we can do this, right? If you are willing to come over to my side on milk dramada. Okay. And I, I will, I'll talk to Dave about, but I even feel like we've, we've put mini moon right into oh, the book. It's in the book so, too? It, so it might even oh, be, be in print form. And we've already started a pretty big campaign to get this going, but at least we really? can. Really? Yeah. So, I think right. I put it in my book too. I'll put that up here too. But anyway, <laughs> you have that one on the shelf? This is my earlier book, Facts from Space. I think I had it in one. the, uh, well, I'll send you a copy. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, no, I, I went back and forth between uh, somebody suggested Wimpy Moon. And I, I like Wimpy Moon for a little while, but then I was like, Pu oh, it just occurred to me. I was like, puny. Yeah. Uh, but so, all right, but you, you got me on Milk uh, milk Dramada. So I'll go, right. I'll go that far. So. But we can agree that anyone who likes Milko Media, that's just wrong. Oh, Milko Media, that's the worst possible. Yeah, it's the worst so, one. Uh, oh, ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bill Kay is asking, what's Dean's next book, Don't Trust the Astronomer, is going to be about? 
Oh my gosh, boy! Somebody must know my inner thoughts. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the book I've been working on for a long time called "Don't Trust the Astronomers." Still looking for a publisher out there if anybody's interested. It's actually uh, pretty much written. I, I I wanted to do this idea of all these uh, ways that astronomers got things wrong, and as the more I learned about astronomy history, I I don't know Fraser if you if you get this, but do you realize that like we're always wrong like I mean, <laughs> like every single time we've been wrong and so it's like uh you know we get better as we go on uh but so this book was going to deal with some of the uh things the misconceptions that astronomers have held over for a long time so i have a i have a chapter on astrology how astrology broke free and bastardized astronomy and i really lay it on I, oh, I yeah astrologers <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, what uh, was I was I was hoping that we could be doing people's horoscopes tonight. Oh yeah, Gemini would say that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But, I'm, uh, a, I'm a I'm a Leo. Oh, you're Leo. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, my fault. My fault. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, Sagittarius gets things wrong all the time, so that's me. Uh, so then I did a, a, a chapter on. Um, uh, you know that the Earth was really flat, and that the, uh, the the sizes of things, and that the you know the sun goes around the Earth, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so one of the the last chapter in it was about Mars, and how we would go back and forth with saying yes, there's definitely life on Mars, and they're like no, there's no life on Mars, and we're like yes, there's definitely life. no. And it's like it goes back and forth like five or six times, and so now astronomers have finally gotten smart, and they're like. Maybe. Me? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to send. Uh, yeah, when you look at say the the current missions to you know you've got the Spirit and Opportunity, you've mm -hmm. got Curiosity, and you got the Mars twenty twenty rover. You've got this really careful step by step accumulation of evidence to find out whether or not the you know there was ever the possibility of the conditions for life on Mars, like. They right, really right. rolled it back. And that's, you know, probably the right way to go. Just be very careful about it. Yeah, well, well thank you for the question. And I'm working on that book. I just need uh, need some help. So don't trust the astronomers out there. If anybody, uh, if anybody wants a book idea, I, I got it ready. <laughs> um, oh, there was a question here. Uh, all right, so Don Guru Debro asks, what is your favorite space fact? My favorite space fact. Do you have Ooh, a favorite boy, space that's fact? that's a tough one. Um, well, let's see. I think I, I go with two. Uh, there's three. I have one that's kind of a dirty one, so I might skip that one. Okay, so we'll go with the uh, uh, one. Yeah, I want to know. One, of, one of my favorite, one of my space facts is there are two correct pronunciations for U-R-A-N-U-S. Mm -hmm. both, both are completely acceptable. Uh, you could call it Uranus or you could call it Uranus. Both of them are acceptable. I changed my pronunciation depending on the maturity of my audience. That is exactly what I do too. <laughs> yeah. In so fact, for I, your audience, I, for I, your audience, it's Uranus. There's yeah. no doubt about yeah. it. You guys are a high class, uh, you know, yeah. culture bunch. So that's what I go with you. But if I was talking ninth graders and eighth graders, you better believe it's Uranus. That's for sure. And so my, uh, I did a video on, on, plans to send missions back to to uranus and neptune and so i said uh you know in our next episode i talk about plans to send a probe to uranus and to study oh. its gas yeah yeah we're, we're gonna probe uranus to study its gas i believe is what yep. i said yep. so uh and people are still giggling it's at the end I, of the I, hibernation I episode yeah people are still giggling about that one so yeah so that's a that's definitely high up there on the list there, there's another one that I, I i kind of looked into soviet uh, uh space missions and there were some that were you know some super dangerous test flights and this one uh soviet spacecraft crashed and he it was out of control coming back through the atmosphere and so the americans were listening in on the radio because they could hear him speaking to the the, the soviet command and all it was was Russian curse words <laughs> telling them how much they screwed him over. <laughs> and like, guys, I mean, like, and it's, oh, I mean, it must have been, if you were the American listening in on this, you're like, holy moly, whoa. I mean, that, so it's like, there's all these really interesting stories from the space program and even American ones. There's so many like little hidden gems of things that, that people don't talk about so much or hear about. 
but the Soviet space program, now that we were like getting access to what was going on there, uh, man, they, I mean, they were doing some pretty bold stuff. Uh, yeah. There was another one where they crashed in Siberia. They were like hundreds of miles off course where they landed. And they even thought ahead of time to pack like weapons, like they had pistols. You wouldn't think like Neil Armstrong went to the moon with a pistol or something like that, but they, the, the Russian ones, they did that and they landed in the, in the Siberian wilderness and they had to like shoot the guns to fight off bears and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. they got rescued by skiers and it's like this weirdest stuff. So uh, yeah, they uh, now was... take a, they have a special shotgun that they use on really? the, from the Soyuz capsules. Yeah. That's what? designed just for fighting bears. <laughs> that's right that's right you get snakes on a plane you get bears on mirror or something yeah, like that i don't yeah. know what happens on the <laughs> yeah i think it's just for when they land on the ground but they're they're ready for any possibility exactly exactly yeah but so that there, it was really fun researching yeah that book to find all these really oddball things that's for sure there's there's like this iceberg out there of of really interesting research and st and interesting projects that were going on back in the six fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties that mm -hmm. you don't hear a lot about. I mean, we hear a lot about the missions that made it, but thanks to freedom of information requests and things like that, like like there were the plans in the nineteen seventies to do a military space station with a bunch of astronauts, mm -hmm. and they were going to go up and they were going to spy. Um, they're going to be like a spy satellite, but human right. beings taking pictures with with long lenses. And the thing almost, I think they, they launched like the, the sample to it, but they didn't actually launch the final satellite up. And uh, there's a ton of these stories. Did you know there was a, a manned mission to Venus planned? Yeah, that they never that they never pulled off. That was a good thing. They didn't try that one. That's for sure. That would have <laughs> well, it's, it, ended very badly. Well, no, I mean, you know, a flyby. So no, you know, they oh, were, a flyby. Yeah, they oh, weren't okay, going to okay, land. Okay, they yeah. knew that Not it was a, a dangerous place to go. Yeah, yeah. No, they were uh, just going to. Well, so the one that is still out there that I think is is really intriguing is there's this uh, this unknown spacecraft called the OTV. It's OTV five, I think it is now. It's a uh, it's this uh, uh, Air Force jet that goes up into orbit. It's an unmanned drone that circles around the Earth. And nobody even knew about it. And so, because they didn't talk about it. And all of a sudden, amateur astronomers are spotting it up there. It's going over like a satellite. And so they predict it. They put it on that website, Heavens Above. Right, Heavens Above, yeah. And so they, they're like, we don't know what the spacecraft is, but it goes around every 90 minutes. Here's where it is if you want to see it. And the government had to actually acknowledge it, which I thought was funny. They're like, yes, there is a spacecraft. What it does, never you mind. <laughs> and so, like, they still haven't said, what it does all we know is it goes up and uh, we watch it and then uh, it goes back down and then that's yeah. it so what is otv5 never mind i don't know <laughs> don't Nobody know knows. yeah your guess is as good as ours um the uh and the x37 yeah it's the x37 b it's the same they, they renamed it otv5 just to throw us off the track oh did but, they okay uh, okay yeah, yeah. So i have actually, i have a i have a theory for what the the x37 is because oh, it looks yeah? like a little space shuttle yeah and so it's yeah. got these cargo bay doors i think it is a test platform that form for the air force to test out interesting materials to see how they handle being in space for long periods of time I know, oh, it's super boring. Really boring I know, really I know. Boring. They <laughs> they they put a bunch of composite material in it, and a bunch of different kinds of steel, and a bunch of electronics. You know, and they say say in the future they're going to build a space telescope or a, an Earth observing observing telescope, and they're going to want some kind of new computer system, and it hasn't been space tested yet, so they can fill the cargo bay of this thing with a whole bunch of hardware that they're looking to test, and then they can bring it back down to Earth, and then they can look and see what happened to all of it to know whether or not it's the right stuff to be able to go into space. That's my theory, and I know it's super boring, but wow. it feels to me like if I was running a covert space program <laughs> these are the kinds of questions that i would want answered right we've got a new chip it's faster does it work in space let's find out let's put it in space bring it bring it back down see if it worked I know. man i thought they were just shooting bruce willis up there to practice for <laughs> yeah. asteroids but no that, the, uh yeah, boy well we can't make a hollywood blockbuster out of that theory for you sorry about that yeah, <laughs> yeah. um 
uh, someone is saying that's probably recovering and delivering spy satellites. The thing is, is that these are the kinds of things that would be seen. So right, you right. astronomers are absolutely tracking these things, right? So they can see when they yeah. what's going on. And exactly. there's some yeah. photographers speaking of like, you know, astrophotographers, they can see the International Space Station and they can take pictures of the different spacecraft that are docked to the space station yeah. all all at the same time. Like it's amazing what amateur astronomers on Earth can actually take pictures of now of satellites. Yeah, and that's kind of what uh, what gets me a little bit is that people think, oh, well, the government's hiding stuff. And like, yeah, well, if they're hiding stuff, they can get past all the hundreds of thousands of amateur astronomers that are finding all this stuff. Like, so this idea of uh, UFOs and things like that, it, you know, for, for me, actually, I've seen the last 10 years UFO reports going down uh, because everybody has phones, everybody can capture this stuff, and anything that's up there that's not like confirmed by somebody else, you know, you don't, you know, just like you know, the, the meteor hitting the moon, we got confirmation from like 10, 20 different sources very quickly that, yeah, something hit the moon during the eclipse. And now it's harder to make a UFO report if you can't get somebody else to show you. Uh, and uh, it's one of those things. Yeah, you, uh, the government can't couldn't hide X thirty seven B from us, so uh, that's the best they got, <laughs> and they yeah. can't hide that one. So yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. Hard to get past us. <laughs> and then, and then times when you see like what happened with the SpaceX launches out of Los Angeles, where suddenly there's ten thousand pictures of this weird thing in the sky on Instagram, all instantaneously, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the thing is, yeah, if you uh, you know, I, I've been finding, I, I'll be honest, back when I started the observatory, I kind of believed in UFOs. I, I'll go out there. I, I kind of believed, I know. And and it's because I watched a lot of X-Files and things like that. But now, as I'm on the front lines of getting UFO reports, I'm finding, uh, you, know, the, you know, people's descriptions are far lacking in, in, in they don't know what day it was, what time it was, what direction it was, what it looked like, if they saw it, if the grandma saw it. And so uh, my joke is now I used to really associate myself with Fox Mulder from the X-Files that I wanted to find the truth. But now that I'm on the uh, in the astronomer room, I really I really relate to Skinner. <laughs> Skinner's God, Mulder, you're such a nut job. Come on, boy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm on Team Skinner now, my, I have to say. My daughter bought me a... a a photograph oh. poster for my, uh, for my <laughs> yeah. office. So, That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, you put that up. Yeah, yep. I'm going to put that up. <laughs> uh, we got just a couple more minutes. So hit us if anyone's got any last questions, and we'd be glad to take them. Um, but uh, again, I just want to remind everyone two books. If you've got a telescope and you want to know what to see, 100 Things to See in the Night Sky and 100 Things to See in the Night Sky in the Southern, Southern Night edition, Sky. Southern Edition, Southern Hemisphere Edition, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, and the big thing coming up, uh, we've got two big things for this year. One is the Apollo 11 anniversary. That's uh, the landing, the moon landing happened 50 years ago in uh, July. And then another very subtle thing is happening. We don't have a giant solar eclipse, but we do have something called a transit of Mercury coming up in November. When Mercury goes right in front of the sun, that is gonna be one of the cool things. And I, I've i seen, um, I figured I've seen 16 lunar eclipses, five solar eclipses, two transits of Venus, auroras, but I've never seen a transit of Mercury. I've been clouded out every time. Wow. This time, I'm not going to be clouded out, so I'm going to see this transit because uh, the next one's not going to be for 13 or 14 years. and I'm not patient enough for that. So. Well, at least you don't have to wait for the next uh, transit of Venus. Yeah, I got my two. That's all that I. That's yeah. all I knew I could get, and so I got two out of two. That's unless I live to 2119. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to make it. Yeah, second, you're gonna do it. Second robot body. All right, I got one last question coming from yeah. Jameson, 1776. What's Dean's opinion of the James Webb Space Telescope? Oh, cannot wait for the James Webb Space Telescope to come out. Of course, I've also been saying that for ten years. I can't wait for the James Webb. <laughs> They're a little behind schedule, a little over budget. But if the hype is correct, we're talking like Hubble times a hundred. Uh, and so if it goes up and works as it's supposed to, this is going to change the game. 
um, of how we see astronomy. Just like Hubble did, this is going to be a big change. Um, the only thing that I would say is that there's ground-based telescopes now have improved so, so much since Hubble that they're going to give the Webb yeah. telescope its run for money. That's for sure. Except can't that wait, James though. Webb is in a wavelength that we just can't do from the ground. So That's going to be the plus. Yeah, it's non-optical yeah. wavelength. And uh, yeah, so when that goes up and gets out there, man, that's going to be good. Yeah. Um, now, do you think that what comes first, your next observation of the um, of the Venus transit or James Webb goes up? <laughs> that's a good one yeah. Yeah, we, uh, well hopefully they'll put the web telescope up in the next hundred years that would be uh be nice but it, it has been delayed and uh whenever i see missions go up into space i'm always like crossing my fingers i'm like okay, all right they're gonna get delayed maybe they're gonna delay but once it leaves the earth there's like nothing any bureaucracy could do to stop it it's up there and uh that's why whenever you see a launch, that's like the best day when it gets off of Earth. Yeah. Because you're like, it is free from, from us. It's, I will uh, not be able now. to breathe from the moment they ignite it to the moment it's clearly <laughs> on a safe trajectory. I'm just going to be like. Yep. Come on. Know. Make it, make it, make it. Yeah, make it. Come on, yep. come on, come on, come on, come <laughs> on. Right. That's all we need is it to, you know, if it does, it does go wrong, then the astronomers are going to get all this flack. Like, why did you spend all this money on this thing and all, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, with the Hubble like all over again. But uh, man, if it goes as, as planned, it should be pretty sweet. Yeah. All right, Dean. We've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, hanging out with us, and, and answering some questions and nerding out about uh, yeah. about space and astronomy. Uh, again, you've got books. More books coming. Uh, where? What is the best way for people to follow what you're working on and what you're doing so they can learn more? Yeah. Uh, well, you can find me on Facebook. That's the best place. Uh, Dean Regas, D E A N R E G A S. Or you can also go to the Cincinnati Observatory page, CincinnatiObservatory.org. And uh, there it lists a lot of uh, my speaking events, the books, and uh, podcasts called Looking Up. So you can check that out as well. And uh, check for look for me on your PBS station uh, for Stargazers, the TV show. Oh, cool. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's all around the country. And you can find it online, too. Just look up Stargazers, and we're there. It's me and James Albury flying through space. Uh, <laughs> just to give everyone a bit of a notice, uh, next week we're going to be talking to Jason Wright, Dr. Jason Wright, who is a uh, exoplanet researcher and uh, best known for a lot of his work on techno signatures. So if you've got questions about finding aliens, uh, then he is going to be the guy that we're going to be talking to. So that'll be next week, same time, same same channel. All right, Dean, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone watching, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we will see you all uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Keep looking up. All right. Let me stop the feed. <laughs>